Turn with me in your Bibles to Judges chapter number 6. I'll get there in a little bit, but just put your finger there. You can uh, you look at me at Judges chapter number 6. Back in the early uh, uh, 
uh, turn of the millennium, they, they were divorcing and it took Ted by surprise, uh, flipped his world upside down. But the reason God's saying all this is in an interview, he was questioned about his, his, his ex-wife's faith in God and where he was. And he, and he said, he said this, he said uh, this in, in very bitterness of soul. He said, listen, he said, I've been suicidal. He said, and my father took his own life and at 24. He said, I, I have a sister who died of a very painful illness. And, and, and so the question that I have in all this religion is, why would a loving God allow people to suffer like that? How many have thought that, or how many has been asked that? I think it's only fair that uh, we may have thought that, or we may have been asked that. I think it's only fair for us as believers not to hide behind some cloak of being, uh, 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 just a facade uh, uh, of throwing up uh, uh, our hands and uh, putting a barrier up, but, but, but being honest and looking at that. And how does the Word of God look at that? The question that God hears probably the most is why. Why? God, why did you let this happen? God, why do bad things happen to good people? George Barnes said the number one question about God is, why is there suffering in this world? And so it's, it's common to, uh, to, to, to ask this, the question, why? Why? And so I want to point us to someone in the Word of God this morning who uh, uh, is a Midianite, and uh, his, his story really happens when God has released the children of Israel. They've been living well, but they find themselves barely able to provide food for themselves because of their sin. We'll address that more a little bit later. But, but, but the word of God says in Judges chapter number 6, and I want to start at verse number 11 uh, because I think it's important. The Bible says, The angel of the Lord came and sat under an oak tree, which was in Orpha, that pertained unto Joash, the Abizrite, and, and his son Gideon uh, uh, threshed wheat by the wine press to hide from the Midianites. To hide from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with me, why? Why? Why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this your might, and ye shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent you? And he said unto him, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with you and smite the Midianites as one man. And uh, I think that I'll just stop right there for the moment. Gideon was feeling like he was all alone against the enemy. <clears throat> Any of you ever feel that way or come across someone that feels that way? That they're the only one against the enemy. And, 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 and heaven begins to say, you may feel that way, but I am with you. The Lord is with you. And Gideon, he's cringing in fear, but, 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 but he says, wait a second, Gideon. Hey, you're feeling alone. God is with you. You're feeling fearful and uh, frightened, but you're a mighty man of valor. Wow, that seems like an oxymoron, doesn't it? You're fearful, but you're a mighty man of valor. That's what God said. And so uh, uh, the disconnect uh, between uh, humanity and, and, and divineness is, is the different perspectives that God has from our thoughts. I'm not going to tell you anything new this morning, but, but when we see adversity, God sees opportunity. And when we see testing, God sees a testimony. And so uh, God sees things different than us. I read a story of a woman that, that uh, she was, it's amazing how some people can make it to the hospital pretty late when they're going to have a child. Uh, maybe some of you have heard that, being delivered on Front Street. Uh, some of them have been delivered on the sidewalk in front of the hospital. 
And, and so this isn't a local story, but one lady, she was giving birth in the elevator. And so as she was in the elevator, the nurse was there and helping her. She said, I just can't believe this. I, I'm complaining about the location of the elevator. And the nurse said, honey, I know this is a bad location. She said, but there was a woman last year that had birth out on the lawn of the hospital. She said, I know it was me. <laughs> And so we, we look at this, and, and the woman was on the floor, and she was feeling bad. It seems like sometimes if we don't have any, if we have any luck, it's bad luck. It's uh, that's the way we may feel about things. But 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 we, when we're feeling that, the psalmist David said, "All thy waves and all thy billows have gone over me, problems unimaginable." One person said, "It's like I'm licking the pots in sorrow's kitchen." But God's still in control. It may feel like in our life there are some bumps. There was a little girl and boy, and the, the brother was older than his sister, and they have what was a mountain outside their house. It was just a really hill, little hill. And so one day the brother said to the sister, He said, I'm going to take you, I'm going to teach you how to climb the mountain. And, 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 and they were climbing up the hill, and she said to him, There's little bumps everywhere, all over the hill. He said, The bumps are what you climb on. We want to become something in life. We want our faith to grow. We want to be someone in Christ. The bumps are what we climb on. The bumps are what gives us our boost. Listen this morning. There'll never be a fountain without a famine. Amen. The bumps are what we climb on. And so the angel came down and he praised Gideon as being a mighty man of valor. Amen. You never know who you are until heaven begins to allow you to be presented with some adversity in life. Gideon would have never known who he was until this adversity come and he's seen what God can do in and through him. We don't like adversity. It, it, it kind of goes against my Western uh, way of living. Uh, we think that it should be a uh, pie in the sky. We should be eating a piece of the American pie. It just doesn't work that way. Adversity comes in life and God allows it for many reasons. We'll talk about it in a few moments. But if there would have never been a crippled uh, uh, head, there would have never been a water or sky. If there would have never been a prison cell, there would have never been a job budget. Amen. If there would have never been snow and valley force, there would have never been a Booker T. Washington. Uh, when we look at life, if there wouldn't have been a little, little one uh, who suffered in the top paralysis, there would have never been a Franklin Roosevelt. When we look at even the deaf and boy, there would have never been a Beethoven. Amen. Those are the tough times that we look at. I said Booker T. Washington. I meant to say George Washington. Amen. God called him a mighty man of God. Adversities are the furnace where the dross of humanity is taken out and our character shines. Adversity. We're all facing. Oftentimes when we face adversity, it's easy to say, why God? Why God? Why do I have to go through this? Every one of us in here, we are human. Every one of us has said this one time or another, and you may be saying it this morning. I promise you, if you're not saying it this morning, you will say it should not tarry. You will say it in the future. And so how do we deal with that? Verse number 13, and Gideon said unto him, Oh, my Lord, my, my, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, and why has all this befallen us, and all the miracles which our father told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of, uh, out, out of Egypt? You see, man struggles with doubt. I want you to think about the way that we were taught to pray. Think about this. I had this little prayer that I was taught to pray when I was little over my food. And it was very, very simple. Maybe some of you pray too. God is good and God is great. You know, we, we, we pray. We thank Him for what He has given to us. And then we pray this prayer, if I should die before I wake. Now, how does all that seem to correspond with each other? God is good and God is great. And then we pray, uh, if I should die before I wake. How does all that seem to wrap together? It's hard to make sense of it all. Amen. God good, God great, if I die before I wake. Because it automatically brings doubt to us. I think one of the toughest things 
that I've ever had to answer is, why do we children die? There was a talk show, and I know we're talking some deep stuff, and this is a different way this morning, but listen, let God wants to help us. There was a pastor who was having a call in a radio show, and a little girl called in, and she said, sir, why does God allow grown-ups to kill kids? They told me in Sunday school that if I would pray that God would protect us, then he would. But my little cousin, Suzanne, she was nine years old, seven years old, and someone killed her. God is good. God is great. But why do people suffer? We, we, can suffer. we can struggle with it. We think about the words that Jesus said from the cross that are really mirrored from Psalms chapter number 22, where the word of God says, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And, and from the words of my roaring, Oh my God, I cried in the daytime, but thou hearest me not. And in the night season, and, 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 and not silent. We, we look at this, God is good and God is great, but why do innocent people suffer? I, 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 we, we think about this, Job, in the, the, the very beginning, he asked the age old question, why do I suffer? Jeremiah, he said this, he said, I'm the potter and you're the clay. This clay said to it, what are you making? So we have to go back to the very beginning of time to understand. God saw that everything that he made in Genesis 131, and it was very good. And the morning and the evening were the sixth day. God made it all good. His creation was good. We're not to lay charge to God. But there's some things we need to look at. God made it all good. But sin entered in. Let's look at four things that I believe are reasons why bad things happen to good people. Number one, because of personal sin. We go back to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve sin. It was a personal sin. It was a choice that they made. Sin entered. Some of the things why we may suffer are because of the sinful world that we live in. And although that we are saved and God is changing us, we still struggle with the sin nature from the cradle to the grave. Amen. That's why we need church. That's why we need the Word of God. That's why we need to be in a place where God can lead us in every area of our life. If you were here last Sunday night, I preached on this. There are things about our life that we should be constantly evaluating. We should look and see if our identity lines up with Christ. Everything about our life as a Christian should line up with Christ. Sorry for those that were here last Sunday night, but I feel like it's important to reiterate this. As I evaluate my life, I've been saved a long time. However, I still need to evaluate my life and ask this question, is the identity of who I am, does it line up with Christ? If it does, it brings affirmation that what I'm doing is correct. If it does not line up, it says I must modify my behavior. And so I modify who I am so that my identity is in Christ. And if I evaluate my life and it's far from Christ and His identity, then I must abort that, that behavior that I'm doing and line it up with Christ. We in our lives can make choices that are sinful choices. And those sinful choices lead to a lot of pain to ourselves and to others. Amen. And so, uh, uh, and you can't look and say someone's sin is greater than my sin. God sees sin as sin. And so personal sin. And so not only personal sin is the reason why uh, bad things happen to good people, but corporate sin. Because all in Adam all die. And that's why we needed the second Adam to come. Amen. Jesus Christ. Uh, we love, we love to, 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 to hold on to Romans chapter 8, 8, 28. But all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. We love that. We quote that. But let's jump back six verses and let's read. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Amen. We still live in this world that's affected by sin and we have to be confident that our life is in God even when bad things happen. I woke up this morning I looked at the news close to where my wife lives in the same county in Ohio that, that we were married in. There was a 
shooting of, 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 of a police officer and a wounding of, of, of another. The, the, a, a book, I'm sorry, two were shot. One was wounded. One lost his life. We live in a world full of sin. That's why bad things happen. Personal sin, corporate sin. The third thing is satanic opposition. We have an adversary this morning. The enemy is real. And Jesus called him a murderer from the very beginning. We think about things like 9-11, Columbine shooting, the shooting that took place in, in Lancaster County with those precious, innocent Amish children. Uh, we, 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 have, we have an enemy, and he is a motivator in people to do evil and to do wrong. Amen. He's not motive, Those people are not motivated by a loving God, uh, but, but they're, they're motivated by a very vengeful devil who's in his working in creation, trying to destroy everything that God has created. And then providence. Whom the Lord loves, He chastens. Adversary, uh, when we have adversity, it has a way of forcing us to focus on God. So sometimes God allows that. Think about this in a world that's gone crazy. Jesus came. Amen. And no matter how powerful the darkness may seem, even in suffering, there is a power that is working for the good of the people. And that is the Spirit of God. And so in verse number 14 of our text, the Bible says, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go this in, in, in thy might, that thou might save Israel the hand of the Midianites, the word go means this. It means forward. Even when we face adversity, even when bad things happen and we don't like it, God is trying to say something. Go. Go. You don't have to stay there and waller in the mud of this. If you remember during Black Black, we did a song that was it, 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 it was called Tell Your Heart to Beat Again. And Danny Goki, we played a little clip of him prior to that. And if you know anything about Danny Goki, he had lost his wife to a congenital heart disease. And, 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 and how heartbreaking that must have been for him. He, he was he was a, a, a youth leader, a ministry, a, a music ministry, a, a, a pastor. And, and so he loses his wife. And as he says, I, I felt the sting of it, but it doesn't sting anymore. Because you know what? Danny Cook, he realized something about God. He realized that we got to move forward. <laughs> And so in the middle of adversity, here it is that Gideon is there and the enemy has come. It's all they can do. He's hiding to make food, hiding to provide for his family. And God says, I, I know you're afraid, but, but I'm with you and I'm going to use you. You're a mighty man of war. Valor, go forward. God wants us to move forward. Gideon wanted to focus on the problem and God wanted us to, uh, to focus on the solution. What is God doing in our life to try to give us solutions for our current situations? We've got to be willing to move forward. Uh, go forward, Gideon. See, we've got to forget the past and, 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 and for the affliction, uh, we've got to not envy others, amen, but we've got to move forward with what our life is and what God has for us. We've got to trust God, not to focus up on the affliction. We've got to go forward and not go backwards. Job, he was confident in God, but yet his trust wavered. He, he, he mourned, he cried, he protested, he questioned, he even cursed the day he was born. He begged God to answer his questions. But we find that God didn't answer his questions. God asked him a question. Job, in all this adversity that you're going through, were you there when I created the heaven and the earth? Were you there when I created the horse and the beautiful flowing mane that flows back its back? You see, God was giving him a lesson. Amen. That, 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 that says this. I, I, you don't have to understand. 
Job said, As surely I spoke of these things, I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me. My ears had not heard of you, but my eye, uh, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I repent in dust and in ashes. And that's exactly what we need to do. If you're here this morning and you've been struggling with why God allowed this or that or your current situation in your life, stop asking God why and for the answers and simply say, God, I repent and I trust. That may sound harsh this morning, but there's no way to move on unless we trust and obey God. Some things we will never have the answers for. Some people live in situations that have long since passed by, but they've not moved. When God says, I want to move forward, I want the bump to be a place where you can put your hand in your foot and climb the mountain of adversity and be a conqueror. You're a mighty man or woman of valor. Move forward. The Lord is with you. See, the main point of Job is that life is unfair. And that's not really a question. That's a given. Some may say, where is God when I hurt? I think the better question is not to ask, where is, where is God when Job hurts? But where's Job at? Where's Job at in this whole process? Allowing the process to play out, but allowing God to be God. God answers instructively to Job. And he says to Job, the only thing, Job, you have control of is your response. So how are you going to respond? How are you going to move into the future? How are you going to get where you want to go? I want to ask you something. Where are you going? Are you moving on with God? Are you building bridges and crossing places that others will get stuck at because faith allows you to build that bridge? Or are you stuck? God wants us to move. To move. Instead of asking all the questions. Any of your parents ever just want to say to your children, okay, you asked the question, no more questions, this is what you need to do. Don't raise your hand. Because we all have. And we've all probably been told that by our parents before. No more questions. This is what I need you to do. I think sometimes God the Father speaks to us and simply says, stop asking <coughs> questions and move forward. I am with you. You're mighty in valor. You see yourself through the lenses of fear and anxiety and frustration. God doesn't look through those same lenses. God looks through the lenses to know what He can work and move and do in your life. Amen. And so we need to allow Him and trust Him and believe that He can do it. I believe it's important in life to have people speak words into you. It's so important. If you're told all the time that you're stupid, you're dumb, you're ugly, after a while you begin to believe that. But if someone speaks into you how beautiful you are, how magnificent the ability you have, all of a sudden one day it's going to click in your mind. You're going to think, man, I can do that because they've spoken to me. Do you look at the Word of God and open it up and read it? God never comes against you. God never condemns you. God calls you to live sanctified, separated from sin, come out from the world and be separate. But God also speaks and gives you the ability that in this world that's affected by sin, amen, I think that all things will work together for good in this groaning world affected by sin. If we trust Him. How's your trust this morning? When we hurt, we only have two choices. We can hurt with God or we can hurt without God. My name is Sister Holly, we come to the piano. I'm sure that most of you remember that shooting there in Colorado, Columbine. Littleton, Colorado. Some students who was given over to the darkness, driven by the enemy who hates life. And that's 
the driving force. There was one young lady, Cassie Burnell, <clears throat> who was asked the question if she believed in Christ. She said, yes, I believe. And she was killed. You and I may never face a gunman who may ask us, do you believe in Christ? But we will be faced with difficult decisions that ask, do we trust and believe in God for more strong and for It's in that moment that we've got to put our faith and our trust in God and one who loves us. <coughs> if you would read about Cassie, you would find that earlier in her life she was involved in the occult and in witchcraft that she had found Jesus Christ to be her Savior months before she was killed. Her brother presented this poem that she had wrote. She wrote, Now I have given up on everything else. I have found it to be the only way to really know Christ and to experience the power that brought him back to life again and to find out what it means to suffer and to die with him. So whatever it takes, I will be the one who lives. In the fresh newness of life of those who are alive from the dead. In our life, we're going to face tough questions. It can really, it can really conquer our faith if we allow it. Questions of why did this happen? And God, why did you allow this? And now you take it away. God, why are you allowing me to experience this? God, I don't understand. God didn't call Job to understand. God didn't call Gideon to understand. God called them to understand that God was with him. We were not there when God made the world. We do not know everything that God did. But I look around and I see a God who did a magnificent job of creating everything that I enjoy every day of my life. So how can I not trust Him in the middle of adversity and in the middle of my struggle? So I choose to go through it with Christ. Saved this morning, I invite you to know the one who will walk with you through the fire to every trial. You may say, Brother Bill, why do you preach a message like this? Because you know what? I deal with folks every day that has to deal with two questions. How do I look at suffering and pain? And how do I look at death? And then I question myself, what have I done to the Congregation of Miracle Revival Church to educate them on how does sickness and pain come about? And why is there death? And if I fail to do that, then I fail to launch you into a future where you will inevitably be, inevitably be questioned by those questions. Where does sickness and suffering come from? And why does death happen? And so I give you that platform this morning to be able to understand this, that we live in a world where there's personal sin and corporate sin. We live in a world where there's a real enemy. And we live in a world where God allows things to happen so that our focus can be upon Him. So if you're experiencing the mountain to climb this morning and there's bumps on the road, I, I, I encourage you, take the bump and grab on and put your foot upon it and lodge yourself close to the, by the, uh, the bump and, and and thrust yourself forward because God is working in you. God is working. If you're not facing those questions today, you will. And so today is preparation for God for when the test happens. <coughs> All right, you told me that you had to take some tests and do some learning modules and things for a Land Rover. You did it so that you could pass. You had to do the work to be able to pass and get that. All of us have been challenged by our jobs or education that has told us you have to learn and be prepared so that you can pass. And God is the same way. You've got to be prepared because the test will come. But today, just like Cassie, 
down in Colorado. What I got that set in front of her. She's already prepared to fill out the answer. Are you prepared? Will I buy a gun? If you're ready to move forward, would you do that literally by getting out of your seat and finding a place of prayer and say, God, you're ready. I'm moving forward with you. I'm moving forward. Let's get our hands Go as well, God. I'm going to reach 